next guest, I'm really excited to, uh, to listen to this myself. Dr. Michael Lake is the founder and chancellor of Bible Life College and Seminary, host of B Biblical Life TV, co-host of Kingdom Intelligence Briefing Podcast with his wife, Mary Lou. He is the author of the best-selling book, The Shin Shinar Directive, and soon-to-be-released book, The Shariath Imperative. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Michael Lake. Hello, Remnant of the Most High God. How are you doing tonight? I tell you what, I'm fired up. I enjoyed Josh's presentation. You know, what you don't realize is he was teaching you Torah principles because the loving instruction of the Father, which is what Torah means, is it, it teaches entrepreneurship. In fact, after we're given the Torah, the first thing we find in Joshua is if you meditate on God's commandments, you will make your way prosperous and have good success. And so I enjoyed that so much. I was also glad, brother, that you used the purple monkey thing because 30 some odd years ago when I started Biblical Life College and Seminary, I almost went with Purple Monkey Theological Seminary. And, and Mary wouldn't let me do it, so you picked it up. So I'm, I'm glad about that. <laughs> I wanna give a word from our sponsor, if I can, before I get into the teaching I'm wanting to do because you know, I could, I could feel, we're, we're dealing with some heavy subjects here, aren't we? Huh. All right, there's not enough food, there's not enough people, we're all going to die. <laughs> Let's pass around the offering plate, glory to God. <laughs> you see, what we're, what we're not taught, when Jesus talked about the gospel, it wasn't the gospel of salvation. It was the gospel of the kingdom, and we are not taught kingdom, and when we begin functioning in kingdom, we live in something that is above what's going on in the world. And part of what God is trying to impart to us, once again, is a kingdom mentality, and I wanna, and I don't have a slide for this, I wanna run real quick to Daniel chapter 13. Daniel 13. 33. And this is a word from our sponsor before I go on and teach what I want to do. Daniel 13. No, it wasn't Daniel 13. I bet it was Daniel 11, wasn't it? For all those of you that are dyslexic, welcome to the club. God can use you anyway. Daniel 11, 13, or 33. Now this is at the pinnacle of the Antichrist's power. When he cannot get any more powerful on planet Earth, God in the middle of this puts a but. I get excited about when God says, yeah, but. Because as he rises to power, it says, verse 33, come on, where's it at? That's not right. Maybe 32. Yes, hallelujah. He said, but the people that know their God, the people that are passionate about their God, not churchianity, not the best life now, not the prosperity gospel, but those that have fallen in love with Almighty God who came and died on a cross for them. And I found something very interesting. When I came to that cross and yielded to it, I died. And the man that stood up from that place, I no longer look at the Jesus that we see standing on the cross or dying on the cross. I see the Jesus that is in the book of Revelation, that his voice is as many waters, that the power of God is so flowing through him that the glory of God flows through his hair and there's fire on his eyes and that is who I'm serving today and that is who you're serving today. And when you realize that, you begin to get strong. Now, I love this word strong in the Hebrew, kazakh. It means to be courageous. But there's a military, you know, be, be strong, be courageous. 
But in the middle of this, this Hebraic definition, it gives a military term for all of you out there that are military. They became hardened. They were hardened assets. <laughs> hardened assets are hard to kill. If I, had, if I had equipment that was hardened today, that means it's EMP proof. You see, in the kingdom, our task is to yield to the king and to fall so in love with him that the enemy cannot get us out of here one moment before our job is done. Oh, man. We're talking, we're, you know, when I get the vision of this, and, and I like sci-fi movies, every once in a while you need to just look at reality compared to the news. Um, <laughs> but in the first Transformer movie, the, you know, the, the, this, this special squad is out there and they're, they're getting their rear ends kicked by this, this weird Transformer thing they've never seen. And, and, this, and this black guy is calling. He says, we need air support. And they, they bring this airship with these saber rounds. 155, I think it's 155 millimeter saber rounds. It's a saber cannon. And he looks up in the midst of this firefight going on and he yells, bring the rain. That's the remnant. You see, my father can send fire down on the enemy with me standing in the middle of the enemy and I walk away. That's the heart of the remnant. The heart of the remnant is also to begin looking and understanding I want to give a military intelligence briefing today. You know, in the military, there are several things you have to understand. You have to understand the tactics of how the enemy operates their doctrine of war. You have to understand their communications channels, but you also have to understand their supply channels. Did you know if you can cut off their supply channels, you've just won the war? What supplies the kingdom of darkness. What fuels the kingdom of darkness? We're going to get into that today. And this is supposed to have an up and a down. Okay. The name Lucifer in the Bible that we translate Lucifer in the King James Bible means the light bearer, the shining one, the morning star. It can also refer to the king of Babylon and his halal in Hebrew. And when you look at Hebrew letters, they're, they're almost like a hieroglyph. Each one means something. And so when you look at Lucifer's name in Hebrew, you get behold, reveal, window, hand, and goat or staff, goat or staff. And you say, okay, Mike, that really doesn't mean a, a whole lot to me. Now, the goat or staff can represent leadership. And so originally, Lucifer had a double anointing for leadership. You know, as we examine Lucifer in both Isaiah and Ezekiel, the truth of this double anointing for leadership will become apparent. A function defined as goad means to provoke or annoy someone as to stimulate some action in them. Doesn't that sound like Lucifer? You know, I remember there's a story that I had a friend tell me that went over to Israel because you know he had studied how shepherds do stuff all the time. And so he wanted to go to Israel and see what a real Israeli shepherd was like. And he looks out his hotel window one evening and this guy is with a shepherd's staff and he's beating the sheep, driving them into this, into this flock. I mean, he's just about cussing at them, kicking them, doing whatever he needs to get them in there. This guy got outraged. He gets, he gets back dressed, goes out of his room, runs down, and he's screaming at this, at this Jewish man saying, you're the worst shepherd I ever saw. You're supposed to lead them. You're supposed to talk to them. They're supposed to love you. And the guy looked up and his light came. I said, ah, oh, I'm the butcher. <laughs> That's the way Lucifer operates. And when you begin really taking apart what it says here, it says, behold the one who was given the double portion of leadership in his hand that becomes the one who provokes heaven and earth. Isn't that what he ended up doing? He caused angels to fall. He caused man to fall. He's the provoker. But we can go on. The enemy is strategic. 
While we're just having little church, he is strategic in everything that he does. In Ezekiel 28, uh, 28, 12, it says, Son of man, make up, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, or Yahweh Elohim, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, there's this whole concept of seal up the sum means you're the measure, you are the pattern of perfection. Lucifer was the highest created immortal that God ever made. In fact, he was the canopy over the very throne of God. He's the anointed cherub that covers. Do you ever wonder why on the Ark of the Covenant there were two angels? It's all because of Lucifer, because there used to be one. He hovered over the throne of God. He was so powerful, he said, you know what, I think I'd like to be God. And so when God replaced him, no matter how powerful those angels were, there was another one just as powerful looking at him over the top of God's throne. He was perfection. But then it goes on when it talks about that, that, he, uh, that he was the full of wisdom. That means he was skillful at war. If you don't understand that about the kingdom of darkness and you're acting like you're still little kids playing on the playground, you're going to be in trouble. Without Christ, we are playing tic-tac-toe while the devil's playing checkers and he's a master checker player. But you bring God into the equation, the devil's playing checkers and God's playing 12-dimensional chess. We need to understand there's not a fair match here. It's not two equal powers fighting against each other. I love in the, in the beginning of Paradise Lost that Milton wrote, after the rebellion, Lucifer and Beelzebub wake up in this crater. And Beelzebub looks at Lucifer and Lucifer said, who knew? <laughs> you know, the Almighty had never even lifted a hand against anybody. Who knew it just took a finger? That's the God that we serve. We need to learn to have faith in that God. Guys, it's time for signs and wonders and miracles once again. But it only happens not when you're doing the best life now, not when you're all about the prosperity gospel. And the prosperity gospel is a cheater's way of trying to get prosperity instead of letting God work with you and him prospering the works of your hands and doing it God's way. You know, this, this whole thing about gold dust falling down, I, I, I'm not impressed. Now, when five-pound gold bricks start falling out in people's chairs, I will be the first one there. I'll pick up a brick or two and finance my ministry for the rest of my life. Otherwise, I'm not impressed. Some of the stuff that we fall for, we're so hungry for signs and wonders that we're falling for gimmetry instead of pressing into God. Because you're not supposed to run after signs and wonders. Signs and wonders are supposed to follow you. Now, let's go on. This is detailing in Isaiah 14, the fall of Lucifer. And I'm going to start with verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast down to the ground which weakest the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the, the, the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend into the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high God. Now, one of the things when you begin reading the Bible, Hebraically, repetition is extremely important. How I many know, you know sometimes Jesus would say verily and sometimes he'd say verily, verily. Verily, verily is more important than verily. But verily is more important than when he wouldn't say that. They, they didn't have exclamation points. They didn't underline. They didn't bold. They used repetition. Now, if I ask you today, what is the superlative of God's character? What is the one word that everything else about God must bow its knee to? Holy. He is kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. That means he, his holiness trumps his love. Uh-oh. 
That's why there was the cross. The holiness of God demanded the cross to save our souls. Love took Jesus to the cross to satisfy his holiness. Come on now. And so five is the number of grace in the Bible. How many books of Moses are there? Five. It's actually an expression of God's grace. Here is how to get out of Babylon. Here is how to not walk like an Egyptian, a Babylonian. Here is how to make sure the mystery religions don't stick back in, in you. And also, this is my loving instruction on how to walk in the freedom that I just gave you. The Torah cannot be lived by a people in bondage. God did not give it to a people in bondage. He sent Moses down, a redeemer who redeemed them out, brought them as a free people to Mount Sinai, and at Mount Sinai he gave them the commandments because now they were free to obey him. And so now here we have Lucifer in heaven trying to create a pseudo grace that would facilitate his ascension into godhood. You need to understand this. He, he had one of his agents go to the garden to promise Adam and Eve something he couldn't do for himself. Imagine that. Do you want to talk about a used car salesman? Because what did the net cash say? You, you, you get into the deal that I'm giving you, the serpent in the garden. You get into this deal that I'm giving you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you how to become gods. They couldn't do it. They weren't gods. They were just simply immortals. They were created as servants of the Most High God. But when he, when he attempted this ascension, something happened on the inside of him. In Ezekiel 28, it said, Thy workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in the day that thou wast created. And I didn't copy the whole right one. <laughs> oh, my computer. I have been fighting with my computer for a while. The next verse says that thou was perfect when thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. It was found in thee. Lucifer is ground zero for something called iniquity. It was discovered in him. When he tried to ascend, it was discovered in him and it became the very force in which he began to establish his new kingdom. Iniquity. Now, iniquity in Hebrew is a vowel, which means to, it means it's unrighteousness, violent deeds of injustice. Now that's a very important term there. When we, when we look at the, the, the serpent in the garden, he only knew God as Elohim. Has not God said. Now in Hebrew, that's Elohim. Adonai or Yahweh is translated Lord, all capitals in the King James. When God began to create man, it was the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. God balanced Yahweh is the mercy of God. Elohim is the justice of God. God balanced justice and mercy together. But the immortals that he created, the angels, only knew him as Elohim. And so when he, he had this, it, his very nature now is he does violent deeds against God's justice, against God's rulership, against God's reign. That is the very definition of what iniquity is. That's what gets him up in the morning, if you will. That, that's, that's the driving force behind everything that he does. And every angel that align themselves with him begin to move in this same force. And there's no redemption for them. There's no turning back for them. They, they are infected with this and begin to move in it. Am I making sense so far? Okay. But Lucifer also has an energy crisis. Verse 18 here of Ezekiel 28, it says, And thou hast defied thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy what? Iniquity. By the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore I will bring forth a fire in the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee. So here we have a being that created a new source of power, 
Now, how many know that everything of the kingdom of God is powered by God himself, all of creation? There is a river that flows from his throne of power that, that powers everything of the kingdom. And so now, but God has all power. He is unlimited in power. That when he spent the seven days of creation, God did not have to sit down and rest because he got tired. He sat down and established the Sabbath because he knew that if he did not do that, man would work himself to death. It's we're creating and we're doing things for six days and on the seventh day we sit down and remember the one who's the creator and give him honor. And in giving him honor, we have Shalom. Now, shalom doesn't, doesn't just mean peace. It means deliverance, health, healing, free from being harassed by the enemy. All these different things that we wrap up in, in, in soteriology, our, our, our salvation is wrapped up in the word shalom. So next time someone says shalom to you, say, I'll take a double portion, please. I want double deliverance. I want double healing. I want double blessing. It's everything of the kingdom but Lucifer is not all powerful, is he? Compared to the power of God, he's spitting in the wind, man. And now God sets a fire on the inside of him to where it's beginning to diminish. But this kingdom that he is establishing, he's got a power. And he can't go out into some field somewhere and have, and have all the Republicans chant, drill, baby, drill. Remember when they were doing that about the oil, the oil shortage crisis, when there really wasn't one? He had, he so, but he is a tactician. He thinks with a military mindset. And so he's got to do something. Now, I, want, I need to expand you just a little bit on a couple of concepts. One of which is, I'm, in the slide after this, I'm actually going to unify super string theory in the Word of God to open up our understanding of the fight that we're in. You know, we, we've heard the comments that you cannot separate the spiritual from the physical. We were created to function in all three heavens. Genesis 1.1, when God created the heavens, it should be plural. If your Bible doesn't have heavens there, add it to your Bible. It's hashamayim. In the Hebrew, there is not one single occurrence of the singular of heaven. It's Hashemayim. Because when God created the heavens, it was an expression of him. So it's three in one, the same as you're, you're a tripartite being, your spirit, soul, and body. You're three in one. There's not three of you. There are three expressions of you that are to function in the first heaven, the second heaven, and the third heaven. And so here he is. Now we, we know that within super strength theory, there are 11 dimensions to our universe. Now we can only really see three of them. We experience one called the temporal or the time dimension. But when he, and so, and I believe that Lucifer fell between Genesis 1 1 and 1 2. Because where it says, and the world became void, the earth became void, that is tahu in the Hebrew. And Ezekiel said, God did not create the world to be tahu. Something cataclysmic happened. And so God comes on the scene. And God says, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw there was light and that it was good. And he divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and he called the darkness night. And evening and morning were the first day. Now there's several things that we can extrapolate out of this. Number one, there's no place in the Bible where the Bible says God created darkness. He came in and he created light and he separated light from darkness. That is the very character and nature of God. And when Jesus comes into your life, the first thing he begins to do is to separate the darkness out of you and brings his light. One of the purposes of Torah is so that you can know the difference between clean and unclean, holy and unholy. Because there's two kingdoms at play here on planet earth. They have their stuff, God has his stuff, and God loved us so much he wrote it down so that we couldn't get them confused. But what we don't realize, and this is where physics comes, the, the, the concept of time, this, this 12th dimension that Almighty God lays across all 11 of those spatial dimensions, 
He does, he, and this is strategic for God. When God said, let there be light, the sun and the moon didn't appear, the stars didn't appear because that's a fourth day principle. He created time. And when he created time, he forced Lucifer and all these immortals that begin to fall after that, he is forcing all of them to experience time linearly like we do. That's why the Bible says that if they would have known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They're experiencing moving through time exactly the same way we are. God limited them for our sake. And so on that first day, a clock began. And one day time is going to end. And we read in the book of Revelation where when there's this war in heaven, and I believe it actually happens during the tribulation period, where Lucifer is cast out of the second heaven. He's cast into our dimensional reality, what we call the first heaven. He comes down and he's ticked off because he knows his what is short. Oh, you're starting to see the light. Tick tock, Lucy. When Jesus comes black, you got some explaining you're going to have to do. He did it for our sake. And he limited our first heaven. And when Adam walked, all three heavens were one. I don't believe that they were parted until after the fall of Adam. And you have this angel guarding the garden, but you have this flaming sword that just, and everybody always puts the, the, the sword in the angel's hands. That's not what the Bible says. That flaming sword is hanging all by itself in midair. It divided up the three heavens. The third heaven, God's throne. The second heaven is where principalities and powers and rulers and all these things do their things. And then there's the first heaven. But we were all created to function on all three heavens. That's why you have a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Let me show you how this works. No, by the way, let's, let's go back. When they're talking about CERN and everything else, that's dimension zero, I would call it subspace. That means it has no expression within any dimensional reality. That's hell, that's Tartarus, that's where, that's where the abyss is. It was, it's, it's, doesn't have access to the first, second, or third heaven. That's what they're trying to open up, is subspace, okay? Now, Am I over everybody's head yet? Are you, everybody keeping up with me? You getting it? The tabernacle that Moses built in the wilderness, the Bible says he built it. God showed him the tabernacle in heaven and he gave him the pattern and he came down and he built it. That original tabernacle was not made of stone like Solomon's tabernacle or Herod's tabernacle. It was covered in flesh and it moved. And wherever that flesh tabernacle moved, God moved with it. You see, the New Testament reality of us being the temple of the Holy Ghost is not plan B. It was plan A all along. Well, that'll make you happy right now. God wanted to live on the inside of you all along. When you look in heaven and you have the four and 20 elders and you have this rainbow over the throne of God, but it's green. You know, doesn't God like purple and red and blue like we have our rainbows here? Why is it that way? Well, why is it that you have four and 20 ribs? There's a heart over the top of your heart. There's a liver that green fluid flows. Your very cavity of your body was created as a mini version of the throne of God because that is where he longed to dwell. Oh, I'm happy already. Are you guys happy? Okay. Now, so the tabernacle is the universal concept of everything, of understanding the Godhead for understanding our own triune makeup. It's all there. Uh, you could understand living the life. It's first with me, then with my family, then in community. If you don't get this right, you can't get your family right. You're never going to get your community right. 
If you want to have a church, the church has to be, each individual has to be walking with God, then the family has to be walking to God with God. And when they gather together, you have a healthy church that can change a community. But since we've taken it out of order, we have dysfunctional people that aren't walking with God and you wonder why the church is a mess, okay? But I want, I want to take this first, second, third heaven, the tabernacle and the spirit, soul, and body, and I want to show you how they function. When you look at it, and remember Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Every Jew knew exactly what he was talking about. When you, when you would go into the outer court, the gate that you went through was called the way. When you walked up to the holy place, the gate there was called the truth, and the veil that was the holy of holies was called the life. In other words, I've always been the only way to get to the Father. Okay? So we have the way. It's all, it, the way works in first heaven principles and it correlates to your body. There are commandments in the word of God because you do them with your body. The same way that you do sin, you, you don't, you, most of your sin you do with your sins of the flesh. So as I begin to learn and to walk with God, and this, this is essential for the remnant in the last days. We have to get our walk right. We're walking with God. We gotta walk with him 24 seven. There's a, there's a critical time in, in Abram's life. Almighty God shows up and in the English it says this, that I am almighty God and, I'm, and you're gonna walk before me. Be thou perfect. I used to read that and go, holy cow, Batman. Because we read it. I'm Almighty God, and I'm not walking with you, boy. You better walk straight, or I'm going to squish you like a bug. Isn't that, isn't that kind of the way you feel? But when you read it in the Hebrew, it's, it's completely different. He said, I am El Shaddai. And El Shaddai has two components. I'm, I'm everything you're ever going to need, and I'm getting ready to walk with you. How many sounds out like that's a good deal? And, and he goes, here, here's something else. I'm also the El Shaddai that means the destroyer that anybody that curses you, uh, they're my problem. I will destroy them that to try to destroy you. But those that bless you, I'll bless them. I'm everything you need, but I got your back, Jack, okay? And I want you to walk with me. I'm going to change your walk. God took him from Abram that didn't have enough faith. He went down to Egypt and said, this is my sister. You know, not only do I wonder about Abraham, I wonder about Sarah. How many of you women that have gone over with you? <laughs> what you talk about? My mama told me there were problems with you. You know, <laughs> he went from that to where later on in his life, before God changes his name and Melchizedek shows up, he has Lot and his family are taken captive by multiple armies and multiple kings. And so he says, let's round up a few boys. Let's go get our family back. <laughs> that doesn't sound like the guy, let's see my sister. No. Something happened in the time that he was walking with God. When we begin walking with Almighty God, we begin to change. If you have a gospel that is not transforming, you do not have the gospel. I tell Mary that I look back at, at, at the theologian that was stuck on Stufid and a member of Goof Troop back in the 90s before we had the old cult coming after us. And who I am now that through the fire and learning how to really walk with God and quit being a crazy matic. That Mike Lake died somewhere along the way and the new Mike Lake I like a whole lot better because he became something in God that he could not have been without the walk. And that's what really God was telling Abram. He said, he said I'll make you perfect. I'll make you whole. I'll make you have integrity. I'll make you that which you cannot be without me being in your life. Is that not the story of the cross way before the cross? We got to get out of this Greek theater mentality that we go to events. Them are nothing more than filling stations because out there's the race. Feed you up, charge you up, mend you up, give you a new set of tires and say, go get them, baby. 
That's what church is supposed to be about. Now, the soul, will, mind, and emotions, and I believe it's the bridge of the spirit to the body. Watchman Nee was right. And so it can have characteristics of both the spirit and even the flesh. When we're dealing with things of the flesh, it's really the soul, but we call it the flesh, don't we? The flesh corresponds to the truth, that fellowship with the Holy Spirit, I renew my mind to the Word of God. But here's the deal. The second heaven, the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness can affect your mind. They affect the soul. That's why we have to renew our minds to the Word of God. And the Word of God does not start in Matthew. When the Apostle Paul wrote, all scripture is given by God and basically has everything that you need to mature you and equip you, he never thought his writings would ever be considered a scripture. He, he was saying the Old Testament plus Jesus is enough for you to rock this world. And now we have Matthew through Revelation with no foundation, no definitions. Every true theological concept starts in the Torah and it's introduced there and then it simply expands with meaning from there. If you can't find it in the Torah, you're not dealing with a legitimate doctrine. Ouch. You can't get the best life now that way. We got to renew our minds to the word. We got to renew our minds to the things of God. It causes us to think differently. What do you mean by that, Mike? Okay, there's famine coming, and I've done some prepping. I've done some things. But we found out today, I, I don't have a ton of salt. <laughs> I look at this one cabinet Mary's been buying, on there maybe a half a ton, but not a ton of salt. <laughs> but I walk in kingdom. You see, kingdom can take a boy's lunch and feed a multitude. Kingdom can be in the middle of a storm and you rebuke the storm and it obeys your voice. Kingdom, you run funerals by attending them. Every funeral Jesus attended, he run. Come here, get up. How many know the funeral's over? Jesus is the kingdom in motion and he is our example. But when man fell, he was disconnected. Spiritual death simply means separation. That, he, that when man fell, he was separated spiritually from God. And let me tell you something. Real life begins at the throne of God. It begins in fellowship. It begins in praying. It begins in abiding in Almighty God. Because for us, Jesus has rent the veil and we have been cleansed by his blood. And he says, come on and sit at my feet Amen. and receive life. Oh, I'm happy. Guys, I am no longer trying to get to the book of Acts. Book of Acts is kindergarten Christianity. That was the beginning. That means when we get to the remnant in the last days, we're going to do more than we see in the book of Acts. Now, one of the things that we are going to see, this isn't my notes, this is free, this is, I'm not going to charge extra for it at all. We're going to say, how many know there's the five-fold ministry, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher? Paul did not think those up. Those were, had been actually functioning within the synagogue for hundreds of years before Jesus ever walked the earth. That's why when Jesus told his disciples, you're my, you're my apostles, they didn't say, cool, Lord, what's that? They knew what that was because when the apostle Paul, who became the apostle Paul, Rabbi Shaul, was sent from Jerusalem on the road to Damascus, he was an apostle for the Sanhedrin. It's an, it was an emissary sent with authority to accomplish a purpose. They were functioning all the time. They're still functioning today, not the, not the foundational 12 apostles, but we have apostles today that are visionaries that have been sent with authority to establish things. 
We have prophetic people today, aren't you glad? Real prophets, not, not corn, <laughs> corn pop prophets. But we have to take that and we, we have this thing going on in the body today. We're, we're back in the book of Judges. Because there is no king. Well, I serve Jesus, yeah, but do you obey his word? If not, then he's, there is no expression of his rulership in your life. The Bible says in, 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 in Job, because there was no king, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Does that not sound like the body of Christ today? But I feel, I don't care what you feel, because you can feel yourself into sin. You can feel yourself into some of the worst things on this planet. The Bible says the heart is extremely deceitful. That's why God wrote it down. It's the word of God backed up by the anointing and the confirmation of the spirit of God as well as the power and the grace to obey the word. But when they would stray from God, they always ended up in bondage. That's what you see in the book of, of Judges over and over again. Are we a people that are free today? We have the illusion of freedom because the Pharisees not the Pharisees, the, the uh, Philistines have taken us captive again. The mystery, the expression of the mystery religions that surrounded Israel, whenever they would depart from the way of God, they would end up in bondage to the pagans functioning in Lucifer's kingdom. God would raise up judges to move in supernatural power to set them free. We're going to begin seeing that again in this day, in this hour. That there are going to be men and women of God that move both in New Testament ministry, but with an Old Testament empowerment. Why? Because he's coming back as Elohim. Okay. Now with all this in mind, why did, this, why did, why did Lucifer need humanity? Was it just to hurt the heart of God? He's just so mean he took God's family away. He thinks militarily, doesn't he? We were made of the earth, and we re reproduce after our own kind, okay? So you go to the first couple, you embed them with iniquity, and he, and he thought there would be no cure because there was no cure for him. He embeds them with iniquity, and they start having kids. What do you get? You get a crop. Because you become a battery that fuels his kingdom. That is the reason why he needed humanity. He needed Adam and Eve to fall. Was to power. Because he couldn't do it. God had set a fire on the inside of him. He was limited in his own power. But he found someone created in the image of God that he could draw this harvest from. We would call them tares. He would draw the power from them. Next time you have a Christian that says, because of the grace of God, I can sin, you look him in the eyes and call him a copper top. <laughs> For those that haven't read the, watched The Matrix, you may not understand that. But all you are doing every time that we sin, we're, re, we're empowering what the devil is doing in the earth. That's why a Christian needs to be fast to repent, get it under the blood, ask for the grace of God to overcome it. So that Lucifer, because what happens is when you allow sin in your life, you give Lucifer a stronghold to begin building power in your family, in your business, in your community. And the more people that he can get the sin, the more power he can draw from that. Oh, come on now. See, that's why the Valley of Armageddon, all of humanity has come against God. They are, they are riling in this iniquity force and they believe that there's enough forcey mass and enough weaponry and everything else that they can assail God. He's creating an army. I want to look at this concept. Anybody ever watch Star Wars? You know, George Lucas isn't that smart. The occult have known about the force forever. 
This is Albert Pike, and this was written right after the Civil War. There is in nature one most potent force by means whereof a single man who could possess himself of it and should know how to direct it could revolutionize and change the face of the world. This force was known to the ancients in the universal ancient whose supreme law is equilibrium and whereby if science order of this, uh, uh, by, uh, if science could but learn how to control it, it would be possible to change the order of the seasons, to produce night and the phenomenon of day, to send a thought in an instant around the world and heal or slay at distance, at a distance, or give our words universal success and make them reverberate everywhere. And in his reading and his writings he goes on to say there's a good side to the force and there's a bad side to the force. Albert Pike was a Jedi. So was Nimrod. Because they got the whole concept of Jedi from the ancient mystery religions. Now, don't we hear any, oh, there's, there's white witches and there's black witches. Baby, they be witches. I don't care white, black, gray, purple, green, polka dot, it don't matter. It's bad, it's forbidden because it's tapping into a power. That's one of the things when the watchers did when they came in Genesis 6, the book of Enoch teaches us that they taught their wives how to move in sorcery. That is moving in that force to control the earth. And isn't that what the Antichrist is going to do one day? I mean, he's describing what the Antichrist is going to do. Who could stand against a guy like that? He doesn't even have to send a drone. All he's got to do is send a thought and you're dead. Unless the shields of God are around you. Come on. The Nazis knew about this. Now, one of the things that I believe is now Nimrod failed in what he was trying to do. Even, now, he, he looked back at Genesis 6, and, and he became something similar to what they became. And when, when, I, when I heard uh, uh, Anthony talk the other day, I mean, man, it made sense to me. They're, they're pulling a Nimrod on us. Because Nimrod was a full-grown man that he used something. The Bible says he polluted himself, and he became a gibberim. He polluted his DNA and he became like one of the children of the watchers before the flood. That's what they're wanting to do to all humanity. And I'm looking at all that in quantum entanglement. Now some of these words are over your head. You know what, did anybody, I mean he was talking about quantum entanglement, you know what that really means? And, and the quantum level there's no distance. And so let's say if we have two protons and they're a thousand light years apart. Did you know that they can be aware of where each other are in the universe and move in synchronicity in the universe because they're, they're quantumly entangled? And they're using this to try to corrupt our DNA, but there's another quantum entanglement, and it's represented at the end of a prayer shawl. Anybody ever see a Jewish prayer shawl? You, you, you have the, the, uh, the fringe, and you have the zitzi, and in the zitzi there is the blue thread, the tachalet, that winds through it. You see, you can't keep that. And in that zitzi you have, you have represented in the knots and the strings all 613 commandments of Torah. You also have interwoven into the, the knots, which, which actually spell out yod heh vav -Hey, the name of God. You have this blue thread, Messiah. Messiah is quantumly entangled into the Zitzi. And as I look at it, I'm reminded that when I died, when I accepted Jesus, the old man died, and this new man is quantumly entangled into the kingdom. Oh, you're going to get this in a minute. Because Jesus said, whatever the Father does over here, I'm doing over here. Whatever the Father's speaking over here, I'm doing over here. And whenever he spoke what the Father spoke, heaven moved and stuff happened. 
And as we learn to walk with him, there is another force. It's called the force of the Holy Spirit. It's the force of the kingdom of God. It's the anointing that flows from the throne of God. And as I learn to walk with him, I am my spirit man is quantumly entangled with God on his throne. How do you keep from the Antichrist killing you when God says move, move? Now, in the military, the enemy shooting at you and somebody else duck, you don't stick your head up and say, what? <laughs> That's how to quickly become a casualty of war. You hit the ground and say, what? Because <laughs> there's orders given, there's movements, there's, 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 there's ways that you're supposed to travel, that there are routes of safety that are established for you. Come on. We have to learn how to hold the line in prayer. There's a movie called The Tears of the Sun with Bruce Willis in it. One of my favorite scenes in it, you, you have these Navy SEALs and they're all lined up and the enemy's about to shoot them to pieces. And he says, hold the line and they set and they, they let it have it with everything they have. About the time that he cries, hold the line and they hold the line, air support comes and napalms every place where the enemy is. Now, what you want is God to send the napalm bomb without you being required to hold the line. But baby, you're never going to see the napalm bomb until you hold the line in the things of the Spirit. We need prayer intercessors and those that walk with God in the last days that will hold the line for God. And God says, stand here, don't move. Don't move off of truth. Marriage is for man and woman. Any other sexual activity outside of marriage of a man and woman is sin. I don't care how many you have marched, you cannot redefine the word, and one day they will stand before his court, and one of these days the supreme justices will bow before him and say, we were wrong. We gotta hold the line for righteousness, we gotta hold the line for truth, and refuse to move. The apostle Paul says, when you have done all to stand, stand, and he had just finished describing the boots of peace that had six inch nails on the bottom of them. You're not going anywhere. Those same boots, if that Roman soldier wanted to, would take your kneecap off. Come on. We're gonna have to get diligent in our walk with God and understanding of the word. We're gonna have to start learning how to move in righteousness and turning off the enemy's power in our lives. The Apostle Paul said it this way, do not lend your members unto unrighteousness, but to righteousness. You see, in Christ I have the freedom to decide. Come on now. How important is this? Well, we, we find out that Nazi Germany were the women of real, they did everything they could to learn how to, how to move in that force. Now what Anthony shared yesterday, because there were also the communication that and, and where Dimension Zero is, where the watchers have been entrapped until, and some of them have become being released since about the beginning of the 20th century with a technological explosion that wasn't by accident. The elite, the elite have been planning on it happening. That's why they introduced eugenics, evolution, and spiritism in the century before to prepare the world for the releasing of the watchers and the lies that they bring. And so everything that the Nazis were doing, they were doing to learn how to flow in that power to become godlike. Many of the inventions that they had, the, the, only, the Nazi flying saucers, you all see Steve Quayle and all that stuff, that was given to them by them channeling watchers. They also had the gift of a UFO crash prior to World War II that could help kind of jump start them. The U.S. was brought into the fold at Roswell after we won the war. 
but they chose, they, they wanted to move in that power. And the elite today are dedicating themselves to move in that power. And what they want to do is rev up that power by diminishing righteousness in the earth, by suppressing the gospel, by perverting the gospel to where it's just a feel-good gospel. It's not the gospel of the kingdom. If you ask people, what are you saved from? Well, hell, no, that's just a side benefit. You were saved from sin, the power of sin. When you surrendered to Jesus at the cross, you were unplugged from the devil's matrix. Do not let sin back into your life to give him power, but rather learn how to move in the power of God that everywhere you go, you short circuit what the enemy's doing. We call that revival. Second Thessalonians, and we've, we've heard this read already at this conference. I want to center in up here on verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, and will he be taken out of the way. And it's talking about the revealing of the Antichrist, the son of perdition. We read that not understanding the mystery religions. When Paul wrote that to the Gentiles, they knew exactly what he was talking about. You see, in the occult, they will create with, within the mind, which is the second heaven principle, because our soul can function within the second heaven, they will do magic rituals in the astral plane and within their minds to create power. And one of the things they do is they will create a womb or incubator to maturate something and then feed it sin, feed, feed it corruption, feed it with all this ritual power until it grows to the place like a baby that it can be birthed. The mystery of iniquity is the elite have got to get iniquity and all the bloodshed and, and take peace from the earth and all these different things to get the iniquity to a level. It serves as a satanic womb to maturate the son of perdition. And the one who is standing in the way is not Michael. It's not God. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not even the church. It's Lucifer. He's not going to let this baby be born this time until it's ready. But iniquity is the womb that he's maturing. And that's why they're trying to remove everything from God out of society. They're trying to remove every vestige of righteousness and holiness from our, from our very civilization, our very concepts. And saying, God does not belong in the public eye. Well, then you're taking us to Mad Max. I don't want to be a road warrior. I like toilets that flush. <laughs> I don't want all that craziness. Well, Mike, what can we do to stop it? Jesus told us. You see, one of the only, the only way possible to enter into the kingdom of God is you got to repent. If you're leading people to Jesus without them repenting of their sins and they, and they know what the sin is and how it is separated from the God, if we don't preach sin, they don't know what they need to be saved from. Once they understand what they need to be saved from, we can give them the solution in Jesus. They repent and they can enter into that kingdom. Amen. Repentance is quintessential to everything about the kingdom. There is not one single revival, true revival in the history of humanity that has ever happened without being preceded by repentance. This is what Jesus preached everywhere he went. This, this was the message of Messiah to the people of God who were in covenant with God. How much more for those of us who were estranged from God that weren't part of the, the covenants that were without God and without hope. How much do we need to be preached to repent? We have churches full of wet sinners and not saints. 
that 30 second little dabble do you prayer isn't doing it anymore. There are no conversions, and therefore they begin twisting the word to match their flesh instead of crucifying their flesh to match the word. We've got to return to repentance. Now I want to show you how this is encoded in the feast. Now I'm sorry, Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny are not in any of God's stuff. Okay? They're not there. And people say, Mike, I can't believe you keep the feast. Well, they're all about Jesus. Why wouldn't I? (sighs) Spring feast, Messiah ben Joseph, Yahweh, the first time he came. He came as what? The Passover lamb. How many of you guys have ever sounded a shofar? Do you know what that really means? The shofar can sound like a cry, can it? You see, since Abram was going to offer Isaac on the altar, and he, and he, told, his, he told Isaac, God will provide a lamb. God didn't. He provided a ram. So they took the ram's horn, and every time they blow it, it was a cry for the lamb. Well, it was a cry for the lamb. And that cry for the lamb brought down the walls of Jericho. That cry of the lamb would be a cry for assembly. It would be a cry for war because God was going to send his lamb and we are a nation walking with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How was Jesus introduced by John the Baptist? Behold the lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Now after the cross when we blow the shofar, it's declaring the works of the lamb. He has come. Salvation is available. Jesus is our Passover lamb. Perfect, spotless. He is that unleavened bread come down from heaven. If I had a piece of matzah here and showed it to you, it is pierced and it is striped. Huh? Without leaven, and leaven always refers to the mystery religions and sin prior to Christ without sin, without the mystery religions, without all that garbage. When he rose from the dead, he didn't raise alone, did he? He emptied out the bosom of Abraham, the first fruits offering. And so when Jesus came as the high priest, he came with a crowd and he said, Father, this is the first fruits. This is the barley harvest. Now I'm going after the wheat. (laughs) <laughs> Wheat represents the Gentiles for you guys to get excited. Summer feast, Shavuot, Pentecost. How many know the first Pentecost wasn't after Jesus resurrected? It was an exodus. It's when they met on Mount Sinai and God set the mountain on fire and gave them his commandments. And, it, you know, and I, can you see Moses? Come on, guys, there's this little burning bush. Come on, guys. Uh, I, I, I come to the mountain, I'm going to show you the bush. You're going you're to be blown away, man. God speaks from the bush. He shows up and the whole mountain explodes on fire. The book of Hebrews says, and Moses said, dude. <laughs> the fire of God on that mountain. And after Jesus resurrected on the next Pentecost, that fire moved from the mountain and settled into the hearts of men to empower us to live the commandments that he gave because Jeremiah 31 says they were written on our hearts as a part of the bread Hadashah. Come on now. And I've got to train my mind to come in line with what the God has written on my spirit and I live it by the power of the Holy Spirit. To not sin. We have the fall feast, but there's this little time period before this. It's called Teshuvah. And it falls 40 days before the Day of Atonement. And they actually divide it into 30 plus 10. Now this corresponds, let me know the first time Moses came down with the tablets. 
there, you know, there, it was kind of like a weekend at the Playboy Mansion going on, okay? When the, Moses was being very nice when, the, when it said they rose up to play. They, they were having a complete satanic ritual, everything imaginable going on. He comes down with the tablets. They begin having a really bad day. When he goes back up, so they were doing that while the 40 days that he was up there. So the second time he goes up, during that 40 days, all of Israel was teshuvah. They were repenting before God, reverencing themselves before God. The second time Moses came up, and that, and that began 40 days before the Day of Atonement. When Moses came down with the commandments the second time, he came down on the Day of Atonement. The fall feasts are about when Jesus comes back. Have you ever heard uh, the Apostle Paul talk about the last trump? Well, on Yom Teruah, there's a blowing of the trumpets and that last final blast for thousands of years has been called the last trump. No one knows the day or the hour that it's going to happen because it goes by the new moon and the sighting of the new moon and the two witnesses and all these different things. And everybody prepares for this fall feast by getting their garments without spot nor wrinkle, bleached in the sun, pressed, all dressed in white, which is interesting that the world tells us after Labor Day, what do you never wear? Huh. Quit following Babylon. Isn't it, it always amazing that you find the world just doing the opposite of God? But... If, if the fall feasts are about the return of Christ, Teshuvah represents the remnant before his return. And so before his return, there are, it is 30 days. And when you get to Yom Teruah, the harpazo happens, which I tend to believe is at the end of the tribulation period. We get out of here 10 days early. While the vials of wrath are being poured out on them for 10 days, we're celebrating a Jewish wedding feast in heaven, which, by the way, lasts exactly 10 days. 30 is the number of maturity. The Bible says, let us and rejoice and be glad, giving the glory to him for his wife has made herself ready. She's fully matured and she's ready to stand by her king. You see, we miss the answer to the Laodicean church in the book of Revelation. Did you ever you know, hear a salvation call? Jesus is standing at the door and he's a knocking. That's not about salvation. The only way to get the Laodicean church, church's butt into gear is they got to realize they got to get ready for the king and to enter into the ketubah, the marriage covenant. If Mary and I were living in a Jewish community and we fell in love and I, I said, Dad, I just got to marry this woman. She tells her dad, you know, I got to marry this guy. They would kind of talk and say, okay, there's an appointed time. My father would come with me to her door and we would knock and her dad would say, you really want to let this joker in? Yeah, that's a, okay. We open up the door, we come in and we sup with them. And I, be, and I begin to tell her, this is what I have done. In my father's house, there are many mansions and I'm preparing a place for you and that I'm the king of kings and lord of lords and that I am king of the universe and explain everything that I was going to do and I'm, I'm representing Jesus here, not me. How huh? I many you know what I'm talking about? And we get all excited and we just start having church and we don't realize that's only half of it. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this, this is what, you're, you're a king. And so... The whole family says, okay, what does she have to become and what does she have to change to match you? And while he's preparing a place for her, she's working on maturing and developing the skills to be his wife. Any of you know how to handle yourself in a Jewish court of law? What? He was the king of the... King of the Jews said so right over the top. In fact, one of the reasons the Jews got mad, they also looked for signs, and, and there was an acrostic, yod heh vav -Heh. It was right over the top of his head. That's what, change that sign, say, say that, he said. <laughs> well, that would have changed the acrostic, and they were taught by Moses to look for signs. Well, they, you know, it's like the old redneck thing, there's your sign, right there, just in case you, you didn't know. 
But we have never gotten busy about becoming the bride. What do I have to learn? What, do I, what skills do I have to develop? What concepts do I have to learn? How do I act in a king's court? How do I carry myself as being married to the Melech Olam, the king of the universe? How do I align myself with him so that every expression that I have represents the one that I'm going to marry? That's how you get the Laodicean church to straighten up. Because any woman to tell you that from the moment that the engagement is set, it's all about preparing for the what? Wedding. And that's Teshuvah. We need to learn how to repent. In fact, the feasts themselves are cycles of sanctification. In the spring feast, you're not looking to make sure that you don't have a can of Campbell's soup that might have yeast in it. That is not what that represents anymore. That was a rehearsal until the real came. The real is I spend those, those days of unleavened bread making sure that the leaven of Babylon has not gotten established back in my life, in my heart, in my home. So that when I exit that and enter into the feast of the Shavuot, I'm at a place where the fire can fall. <laughs> we need the fires of revival. But we gotta let the Holy Spirit do his job in getting the leaven out of our lives. That's why I go into introspective mode. I don't care what's in my cupboards. I'm not worried about if I put a piece of bread in my mouth or not. I'm worried about how much of Babylon I have already gotten assimilated with without knowing it over the, over the last year since I have done this to get mystery religion out of me. Because I am sick of, a, of mystery religion doctrines being pronounced from pulpits today. Hyper grace is simply the mystery religions being preached under the gospel. Well, brother, I don't know. Well, there's a guy named Ali Esther Crowley. He was so lovable, his mama called him the beast. Hitler was scared of him. And he channeled this book called the Book of the Law from this demonic force and the very theme of his religion is do, up the, do as thou wilt is the whole of the law. Does that sound like a lot of preaching today? They're Crowleyites masquerading as ministers of the gospel. You see, love for God is the motivation that I have that empowers me to crucify the flesh and walk in God's ways. Because every one of us gets into that situation where our flesh is screaming to do it. Anybody ever been there since have the preachers? <laughs> Everything in you, I want to do that. And I look and God said, no. Well, what do you do, Mike? I grab that desire. I take it to the cross. And I beat the living hell out of it until it's dead. And Almighty God looks down and says, my kid loves me. That's my boy. Do you see what he did when that, when that demon put that desire in his flesh was screaming to do it? Did you see what he did? He went and he nailed it to the cross. And when it tried to get off, he kicked it twice to make sure it was dead. That kid loves me. You see, true love for God empowers us not to sin and to walk in the kingdom. Now the fall feasts, we're coming to them very rapidly, aren't we? You gotta be ready that this teshuvah, we get out of here 10 days where the Bible says that for the elect's sake, the time will be shortened. People think, well, it's gonna take you know, years for God's wrath to be poured out, 10 days, baby. They're not gonna know what hit them. They're going to shake their fists at him, knowing he's coming back. Refusing to repent. We're headed there. And if we don't have a life of repentance, we're literally empowering the enemy.
Guys, I'm burning up on to take this off. Is this all right? You're about to see how a turkey gets cooked, I think. <laughs> the more that we nail sin to the cross, the more the power of God can flow through us. Now, one of the things I believe is that the book of John, 1 John, was written for us now. When you look at the sequence in which the books of the Bible was written, John didn't begin writing his books to include the book of John until 30 years after Paul was gone. So how many know that he knew the Pauline revelation? Okay. And, he, and so he writes the book of the Gospel of John so that we all might believe. Then he they try to kill him in camp, and so they exile him to the Isle of Patmos. And on the Lord's Day, on the Sabbath, he was worshiping. God visits him, and, he, and he's saying, Ivy, did you see all the stuff that's going to happen? Can you imagine this apostle of love that so is passionate about God's people? What do I do? What do I do? I, 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 I told him, I'll tell you what, the prophecy's about to hit the fan, and I saw how bad it was, and I can't even comprehend it. He, what would he do if he saw your iPhone? How would he describe that? So how is he a man lifted out 2,000 years ago, brought in seeing our technology today? How is he going to describe that? He did the best he could with the words he had. But he, he, can you feel it's like, I don't have words to describe what I'm seeing coming. And some of it was so bad and the words were so horrendous God, that I heard God wouldn't even let me write them down. What do I do? What do I do? And I can see him up nights and praying and seeking the heart of God. And then finally he gets the anointing and he picks up the pen and writes 1 John. 1 and 2 John are the only books in the Bible that even mention the Antichrist. And it's all about this is truth. This is lies. This is the spirit of truth. This is the spirit of error. This is Christ. This is another spirit, an antichrist spirit. There are many of them in the world, but one of these days there will be the antichrist. And this apostle of love gets bold. He says, if you say you know Jesus and you're not keeping the commandments, you're lying, Jack. Anybody ever read 1 John? He'll smack you three times on the first couple of chapters. Thank you. But at the end of the book is where I'm after. Now he, he says, now listen, the violation of Torah, the violation of the law is still sin. He who walks with God no longer has a heart to sin. He wants to be free from sin. Now if we say we're without sin, we're a liar because we'll stumble, we'll fall. That's why we need to have repentance. And he loves us, he's faithful, and he's just to forgive us. When we do stumble, you run to Jesus. He's not going to chew you out. He's not going to bat you around. He's going to come and clean you up, and he's going to clean you up whether you feel like you deserve to be clean or not because you came. It's not about feelings. It's about faith. And then at the end of his book, he says, when a man keepeth himself, when a man keepeth himself, now what's the book about? Not walking in the mystery religions, not walking in sin. So if you're keeping yourself, you're not what? sinning. You're trying to really walk with God. And then he makes this audacious statement, and the wicked one touches him not. It's time for some special forces in the kingdom of God. We've got to learn how to become hardened targets. And the only way that we can become hardened targets is to get our hearts right with God and to stay there and begin walking in his ways by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you feel like you don't have what you need, you cry out for grace. Grace is not the excuse to sin. Grace is the power of God not to sin. Yeah. It's at that moment of temptation that you raise up and say, Father, I need your grace. I need your grace not to yield, but to conquer this thing by the completed works of Christ, to bring this underfoot. And the more that I do that, the more the peace of God, that shalom of God begins to manifest in my life. And then Paul makes this audacious statement. He said, may the peace of God soon crush Satan underneath your feet. 
You see, the devil's not going to get to bring out his A team and God brings out his G team or Z team. God's getting ready to bring out his A team. Jesus knew this. When God took them to Mount Hermon and said, you know, who do men say that I am? And then he, teach them, and he teaches them about binding and loosing. And we read all that, but we don't really understand all that. That's ground zero for Genesis chapter 6. Mount Hermon is where the 200 watcher angels that caused that whole mess, that was where they descended at. You, you had this cave that the Greeks said, well, that is, that is the entrance to Hades there. You had a grotto to Pan built into there. Nimrod's fortress is in that mountain. And if you look back at the topology, there is a goat head in the topography of that mountain. That's the place that Azazel is bound. The worst of the worst of the watchers. Jesus takes them there and says, and people say, well, you know, that was just for the apostles of that day. They never had to deal with a watcher. We do. Because 70 generations from Noah's flood was about the beginning of the 20th century when we went from horse and buggy to going to the moon. Technology, it goes hand in hand. There's technosaucery going on. All technology can have spiritual power flowing through it. Oh, Mike, you're full of bull. Have you ever felt the anointing of God on a video? You just corrected yourself. Spiritual power can flow through it. And what they were taught before the flood was that sorcery and technology were two sides of the same coin. And now all of our society is living by this technology. We can plead the blood of Jesus over it, neutralize it, and ask God to flow through it. But we're facing stuff that the apostles did not have to face using a quantum computer with a quantum entanglement and causing a global thing to activate all the nanoparticles in our bodies to create a triple helix and cause us to become Nephilim. Paul would have said, say what? That stuff sounds scary until you realize that the kingdom of God is above it. If I learn to dwell in the shadow of the Most High, and you really don't know what that means until you study the life of David. This says I still have 12 minutes, I'm going to take three. Um, I'm cheating here. Um, he had the Ark of the Covenant in his backyard. He was not a priest. He was a king. He could not touch it. If he touched it, King David would have died. Which kind of makes us remember we need to make sure that God is reverenced. He is kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Okay? He's holy. And when David penned that, what he would do is he would get on his hands and knees and on his face and he would crawl just as close to that Ark of the Covenant so that the shadow of it would fall on him. And it was there that he worshiped. And he said, man, if you could just stay here. No pestilence by day, no fear, no terror by night. You'll see a thousand fall by your left hand, 10,000 by your right, but it won't come near you. And he wrote it for us. He wrote it for us. Now you can say, yeah, but. How many know there are believers dying right now overseas? but what they're not telling you on the news. And that this is something that has always been about martyrdom. From the devil's point of view, we're like cockroaches. You kill one, you get a hundred. Okay? That when, whenever they would kill a Christian or the Romans would kill a Christian, they would get more and more and more. Russ Dizdar shares about how that when they, when they had the 11 lined up by the, by the ocean that they cut off their heads, there were actually 12. 
But the last guy wasn't a Christian. He was just a secular guy that got thrown into, into the mix and they thought he was, he was a, 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 a Egyptian Christian. And so he hears the testimony of every single one of those. Now he could, when they got to him, he said, man, I'm not a Christian, I don't care. You know what he said with tears in his eyes? I want their God. I want their God. You see, what, what you're not hearing on the news, for every Christian they kill, there's a thousand Muslims coming to Jesus. You see, there, there is a special gift for that. There is a grace for that. And if, if God has that as a part of our destiny, it, that, that blood is not shed without purpose. But that doesn't mean we're all going to go that way. There also has to be the ones that hold the fort. There has to be the ones that do the great exploits. And what we've got to choose to do is I'm going to either I'm going to serve him or I will die for him, but I will not turn from him. And I'm going to be the biggest pain in the devil's backside that you have ever seen because I am serving my king. This thing is far from over. The greatest miracles are about to be seen. That their techno sorcery cannot touch the remnant. That with all the things that they try to do, the gospel will go forth and there will be a clear example. This is a true believer. This is sinful world. Now, Choose, because when the oppression comes, all the senos, Christians in name only, go scurrying off somewhere into the woods. The true believers, will, they will hold the line, and God will have their back. And we will see signs, we will see wonders, we will see things that we look at the book of Acts and realize it was just the beginning. There's a reason why the book of Acts doesn't have a the end at the end because it will be finished in the last days and very possibly in our lives. Guys, that is the king that we serve. That is the king that we serve. Hello, Rim to the Most High God. This is Dr. Michael Lake of Kingdom Intelligence Briefing and Biblical Life TV. I want to personally invite you to the Hear the Watchmen Conference in Dallas, Texas on March 30th through April 2nd. I'm going to be there along with many great men and women of the Kingdom of God to include Derek and Sharon Gilbert, L.A. Marzuli, Russ Dizdar, Coach Dave, Mike Norris, Pastor Paul Begley, Josh Talley, Michael Bodea and many more. Friends, this conference is God's great gathering for 2017. It will serve as a G3 intelligence summit for the kingdom of God. We're gonna hear great messages. We're gonna hear prophetically of what God wants in 2017. There'll be time of ministry, of empowerment, times of fellowship, and networking with remnant from all across America and from around the world. For more information on this conference and to reserve your tickets, go to www.hearthewatchman.com. That's www.hearthewatchman.com. Seating's limited, so make your reservations early. And when you check out of the shopping cart, make sure that you use the coupon code LAKE, L-A-K-E, and it'll save you $20 for each ticket you purchase to this powerful conference. God bless you, and may you be empowered to fulfill God's purpose in your life in 2017.